much. My name is Zach Semke. I'm with Passive House Accelerator, and I want to um, welcome everyone to our Passive House Prefab Summit number two. Uh, this is a very exciting sequel with uh, brand new guests and manufacturers and insights. So we're really happy that you're here to, to share all this with us. Um, I wanted to is made possible by our sponsors, generous support from our founding sponsors, our stakeholder partner, and our patron sponsors. So I want to take a moment to thank all of them and to encourage everybody here to uh, to patronize our these sponsors. Um, they're they're um, helping to support our work in driving innovation and, and sharing innovation and stories. And I particularly want to uh, thank our summit sponsors, the, the sponsors of this event in particular. So I want to thank VaproShield and RDH Building Science for their support in making tonight's event possible. And I wanted to um, thank Aaron Gould uh, for VaproShield's support and invite Aaron to say a, a few words about VaproShield's work. So Aaron, take it away. Good evening, everyone. I'm on the Eastern US here. And uh, although Viper Shield is based out of the Seattle area, a little fishing village called Gig Harbor, and assuming everyone can hear me. Um, so if any of you are unfamiliar with us, uh, these photos in the background are just to support and you can read what some of them say, but there are a few projects and a few background of what we do. We'll be 20 years old next year. We're primarily known for our self-adhered vapor open membrane systems with liquid flashing. We also have a stainless steel flexible peel and stick option. Uh, we provide a 20 year material warranty and we can go up to 12 months of uh, UV exposure during the job site. Uh, it's very simple. We have black for open joint rain screens and then we have orange for everything else. And we have both mechanically attached or self-adhered membrane systems. Again, using either the liquid or peel and stick flashing options that we have. Uh, if you take a look at this graphic here, uh, this demonstrates the importance of having higher perms and the drying potential that you can have from that. 1,400 gallons of water versus 50 gallons of water from an only 18 membrane. So the difference between 50 perms and 18 perms is pretty massive over that hour illustration there that was just shown. We can go either over or under exterior CI or both as some of the projects you will see uh, here. And then we pay a lot of attention to detailing because obviously interfaces are where leaks happen. Here's an E331 test in our lab where we're evaluating fastener penetrations, which we continually do. Uh, this was, uh, we've been around the block. Uh, we've experienced a lot of large projects like Hudson Yards here in New York. A lot of mass timber. We've stayed at the forefront of that. We have an ideal solution for mass timber and panelized construction. And uh, meant to actually have a, a photo of a current passive house mass timber project we're working on. It's an eight story in New York right now. Um, but this is one that was recent and I put another, uh, you can put a link up to this in the chat if you like. And some of you were on this, the uh, uh, multifamily New Jersey project, the Condela Lofts that was uh, highlighted here a couple weeks ago. Here's a nice panelized project in Chicago that I used to be able to see from the flight path flying into O'Hare. This one's up in Michigan. It was 250,000 square feet of panelization. And so uh, this was the largest rough opening I ever experienced. I, it was a quarter mile of flashing. I thought I'd put that up just for fun uh, to show some of the different things. We do free training. This was a union training where we had close to 70 people show up. And we're here to help you scale your uh, panelization and passive house efforts. There's a nice project in Seattle. We have a lot of details and technical helps at vipershield.com. We provide transparency and I'm our sustainability manager and heading that up. Now we'd like to turn it over to everyone else and encourage you to visit us online and hit me up in the chat here for any questions that you might have. And we look forward to the rest of the event.
Thank you, Aaron. So I want to just, uh, um, I mentioned uh, Mary and her role in curating and organizing this event. I want to thank Mary James. You may know her uh, for her work with Passive House Buildings Magazine. She's been the editor of that magazine for, for years now. And she's now a part of the Passive House Accelerator team. So we're very happy that Mary is here to, to, uh, to play a number of roles in tonight's event. So Mary, I know you had a couple of words you wanted to share. Hi, I just want to say hi and thank you to everybody, particularly the 10 wonderful speakers we have tonight and of course the fabulous audience. Um, and I also want to remind everyone that there's going to be a follow up prefab publication coming out in early 2021 with all these companies and more. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And um, I want to introduce our tonight's moderator, Sean St. Amour. I think most of you know him already, but in case you don't, he's a product consultant with 475 High Performance Building Supply for Western Canada. After graduating from UBC with a degree in wood products processing, he has been involved in various areas of construction, including prefab, multifamily construction, and even operating his own business. He's been involved with our happy hour and our construction tech events. If Sean isn't talking about Passive House, a rare event, he's playing Lego with his daughters or working on his hubby do list. So take it away, Sean. My passion is sustainable prefab passive homes. And so I'm very excited to hear what the panel has to say today. Before we dive into the presentation, I just want to take a second and ask you all to consider prefab in your 2021 plans. I hope that you will reach out to either the six companies we had on our first summit or the, uh, the ones we're featuring tonight. I hope that you don't see prefab as a competitor, but as a collaborator to your process, just as you might see an electrician, a plumber, or a tile setter as part of your family. For the builders out there, prefab is here to assist you as you handle a shortage of skilled tradespeople or the adoption of high performance standards. As Ted Benson said a few months ago on the BS and Beer Show, prefab is not taking away the craft of how we build homes, but it's only going to enhance it. After the unprecedented year of 2020, I also hope that in 2021, we start to celebrate more. How many of you do a rooftop party uh, app, just like how the timber framers used to do for when they were raising their structures? Let's go back to celebrating the craft and, and how we enjoy it so much. So if you're a designer or uh, or, or, or a builder or somewhere supporting the construction industry. Let's celebrate more in 2021. So let's get started by celebrating you. Thank you all for coming tonight. Cheers to the presenters and cheers to, to you. So I hope tomorrow you'll make a call to one of these talented companies, connect with them, start to build a relationship with them so we can grow the passive house prefab pie and all of our slices can grow collectively. So on that note, let's get into the nuts and bolts of how these prefabricated companies uh, manufacture the components, how they get installed, and how these companies also have different business models. Yet these are all green jobs manufacturing here in North America, and I know that's a positive trend. So to kick things off, let me introduce Ilka Cassidy from Holtzrum Systems.
Um, yeah, we are really happy to be here. And um, I would like to introduce our team first. So there's Steve Hessler. He has hands-on experience as a timber framer and high performance builder. And he has worked in the panelized construction field for 20 plus years as a structural designer and CNC programmer. Foremost, he is our CAD work modeling Jedi and the brains behind 2D and 3D content integration and development of our user interface between us, the client and the factory. And then there's David Hessler, his brother. He is a computer programmer. He founded three software development companies and was a director of so software de development at Dassau Systems. He is a biologist, has managed the construction of an eco village and of the grid house. And he is our voice of reason because he, he thinks in data. And I am Ilka Cassidy. I have an architecture degree from Germany and I am also the co-founder of C2 Architecture. And I have been a passive house consultant uh, since 2013. My focus is on energy modeling and passive house detailing but I can also call myself a fabrication consultant and virtual builder by now. Um, Holzraum system is not a manufacturer like uh, most of the companies represented here tonight. We are actually a design and consulting partnership connecting builders and uh, architects with low carbon passive house design and offsite manufacturing. We formed a partnership with Blueprint Robotics in Baltimore and became their uh, design and communication interface for single family projects. We also partnered with uh, Stolze Timber Systems in uh, Whitefish, Montana. And we're working on prototyping CLT construction for high performance development projects, as well as bringing CLT options to the East Coast. So our goal is to expand our efforts in connecting more capable factories with passive house projects, finding the uh, right fit for each project based on factory insight distance, project site and manufacturing time slot. Our uh, single integrated manufacturing model, our SIM, is, parts, is a parts-based model for the entire building which connects typically kind of siloed, build, siloed building perspectives into uh, a holistic factory specific high fidelity model that is then used to generate machine files, shop drawings and installation instructions. Um, I believe that offsite construction and virtual building flips the construction industry on its head and levels the playing field for women as powerful voices in design and construction. And um, I really want to encourage women to explore all these new opportuni opportunities. And with that, I'm going to let Bill Rothman from Blueprint Robotics talk about their multifamily approach, passive house approach. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? So good. Um, thank you, Oka, Holzrum System, and uh, Passive House Prefab Summit for allowing us to join. Um, my name is Bill Grothman with Blueprint Robotics. Uh, my main focus of Blueprint Robotics is sales and business development. Um, I'm joined today on the Zoom with uh, Martin Lettenmeyer, um, one of my colleagues. Martin's a critical member of our Blueprint team, a native German who brings deep practical knowledge of both Passive House and just about every aspect of uh, our type of Offsite construction. He's going to be available for the Q and A. Um, Holzer Systems. The focus today, but um, I'm just going to share a little bit about a couple of quick notes about Blueprint, which is the factory that you saw in the, the video Oko showed. Uh, about six years ago, we started our journey um, as a fresh startup. Uh, we built a 200,000 square foot facility in Baltimore, Maryland, filled it with Weinman machines. Um, we fabricate and ship in a panelized format, uh, building the wood frame. Uh, sheathed with the WRB, um, installing windows in our factory. Um, we deliver, also deliver a prefabricated MEP solution that we complete turnkey in the field. Um, not necessarily always how we approach single family, but that is our, our uh, multifamily approach. Um, Holzrum System has been a great partner utilizing us 
to successfully execute passive house custom homes. Um, our main focus, however, is the multifamily market. Um, uh, particularly, um, passive house multifamily is at the top of the list of our targets. Um, the, the passive house projects really allow us to show off our ability uh, to precisely fabricate passive house details, which were you know, resolved in our BIM process. Um, so, um, you know, we're looking forward to um, continued success with Holzheim System and, um, and our, our multifamily passive house projects uh, that we have in pre-construction and under contract um, currently. Um, our, uh, probably our largest that we have right now of note is uh, about 115 unit project in Washington, DC with uh, Somerset Development and Whiting Turner, um, which again will be passive house certified um, that will start construction in 2021. So um, I appreciate you having us again and listening and um, uh, hopefully I'll see some of you guys soon. Thank you. Perfect, thanks Ilka, thanks Bill. Our uh, second speaker is Alan Gibson from GoLogic. Um, hi everyone, I'm Alan Gibson. I'm owner of GeoLogic LLC. We're a 25 person design build company based in Maine. Next slide, please. I'm gonna go pretty quick, Zach. I don't have much time. Um, so we've been around for a while. This is our first house to go home back in 2010. That was passive house certified. And we started our business at that time and basically founded it on doing all passive house all the time. Um, our build territory is the Northeast US. We are general contractors. So in sort of Southern Maine, we will general contract projects outside of that area. We will design and then deliver a shell package for others to finish. Our mission is to design and build healthy, comfortable, low carbon homes that are affordable to a wide segment of the population. Next, please. Uh, I'm not gonna claim that we're an affordable home builder. Uh, we do a mix of projects. We do some higher end custom homes. We've done some institutional work, um, but our bread and butter is single family homes. Uh, next, please. And to try to, you know, tap, some of that, crack some of the, the affordability nut for Passive House, we developed the Go Home, which is a series of pre-designed homes. Um, next, please. With models ranging from 600 to 2,500 square feet. Um, we've built most of these multiple times. Uh, the design process is much more streamlined uh, because um, they're pre-designed and we allow some customizations but it allows the whole process to be more streamlined and therefore uh, less expensive. Next, please. So here's a shot of our crew in our facility. We're watching a slideshow about Swedish prefabrication. Uh, we draw a lot of uh, inspiration and information from them. Um, and, you know, we've been penalizing in earnest for about three years now and really trying to go up that learning curve and figure out how to do it um, kind of from scratch while taking our, our experience being site builders into the shop. Uh, next, please. Uh, my crew has really been figuring this out. Um, here's our space. It is not high tech. Um, we uh, have built it pretty organically for pretty uh, low investment. We have some lifting equipment. We have um, an automated saw stop. We have a lull and a little overhead gantry. That's about it. So. Really, um, no, this is something that there's, anybody could start doing. Uh, and I, I encourage that because I think the benefits are so great. Next slide, please. And just, you know, taking it from outside to inside, they're just great benefits. You're building um, not in the mud, in the rain. Therefore, you can concentrate better on what you're doing. Um, you have, we have higher quality product. Um, you know, thing about panelization is, that's different is that you have to do most of your thinking before you cut your first stick, right? So there's a lot more pre-planning and the, the shop drawing process is really important. And that's another thing that we have been working out going from the architecture to 3D modeling and then shop drawings. Next, please. Uh, we put absolutely as much as we can in the panel in the shop to make it a value added product. We install windows and doors we air seal them flash and put trim on them. We add a lot of exterior insulation. Uh, next, please. Here's a typical build. This was out of state. So a local GC did the foundation. 
we came in with wall panels, floor panels, roof structure. We made an airtight, watertight shell and then pass it on to the local builder who did the exterior finishes. Next, please. Here's our typical wall. It's a two by eight stud wall with cellulose. There's a sheathing layer. That's the airtight layer. Uh, this is showing mineral wool insulation in the drawing. We've actually shifted away from that. And now we use rigid wood fiber uh, with a WRB over that and then a uh, strapping layer. Next, please, about an R50 wall. Here it is in the flesh. Uh, we use gaskets to join the panels. When we're done with our shell installation, we verify air tightness with the blower door. Passed, uh, we meet the pass without standard. You know, this is a fairly complicated thing. It's got a lot of layers um, and it's all gotta be right or you're gonna have a lot of mess on site. So that's really key to doing it successfully. Um, next slide. Um, this particular project had a second exterior skin because it was getting cedar shingle siding. And this is a installation we did on a remote island in Maine. Next, please. Where the logistics were a nightmare, but the crew did a great job getting the panels in there and then flying them in to install them. Next, please. And the one interesting thing about this project, you can see we put in as many windows as we could into panels, but there are some big expanses of glass that we couldn't build. You know, we, they were too big to put in a panel. So we were happy to do that, it's fine, but just you should understand that it's gonna take more time and therefore be more expensive when you can't do everything in a panel. Uh, next slide. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to mention is uh, panelized deep energy retrofits, where this is something we want to get into. We did a feasibility study for this building. It's a low-income housing, triple-decker apartment building in Lewiston, Maine. Next, please. And we developed a potential wall panel that could skin the building and bring it to pass without standard. And uh, we hope to do this project and more of these in the future, knowing that this is like there's huge need for this. So that's my time. Excellent. And I love the detail of the connection process there, Alan. And again, even the scale of the problem, we might come back to that in the question period. So thank you very much. Sure. And uh, Thomas, uh, Stitch from Stitch Consulting and Design, you are up next. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Thomas Stitch. I'm based in Inverma, BC, um, Canada. And I'm probably not a typical um, prefab builder because we don't build, uh, we plan design. Basically like Ilka, we use um, 3D CAD CAM Dietrich software. Um, and um, I'm probably here because I, we pushed the limits a little bit with our own passive files that we built this year. Um, I'm saying pushing the limits because um, we um, let it produce or manufacture in Europe. Um, but a little bit uh, to myself. So I'm a carpenter and grew up in Germany um, and worked in uh, Slovenia, Sweden and Germany. Um, graduated from university uh, in wood engineering. So I'm a structural engineer for specialized in wood. And since 2009, I'm a certified passport designer. And since 2013, we um, are accredited passport course provider as well. Um, so we offer courses in Calgary, basically, um, and BC in Milman. Um, we specialized um, over the years on CLT. Um, Zach, maybe you can put up the first um, picture. So I haven't really prepared a slideshow. So I will show pictures from our own passive house. Zach, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so we specialized on the la in the last years on CLT um, that we use as a structure and finish on the inside. And we focus on the structural interior insulated airtight shell. So we provide the structure, CLT and Lula usually. Um, we use solid wood fiberboard as insulation, and we have two window suppliers um, from Europe that we use um, and supply windows. Usually we ship everything separately in containers, 
Um, as I said, with our own house that we built this year, or started pretty much one year ago, 10th of December, the first container showed up. Um, we pushed the limits, we planned everything, and um, the windows were built in, um, insulation was on, and siding was on. Um, maybe, so on the right-hand side, you can see um, a, um, thanks, um, a floor plan, a floor panel. So our limitation was basically container size, um, 40 feet and um, high cube, um, almost nine feet and a little bit um, high. Um, one wall was one panel, including siding and insulation and windows built in. Um, except two walls that were longer than 40 feet, uh, so we had to put a joint in there. On the left hand side, you can see the um, south side of the um, of our house. We have exterior shading, uh, motorized, um, and floor to ceiling windows. On the right hand side, as I said, you can see the floor plan panel, and on the right hand side, the container. So we unloaded and installed right out of the container. Um, and it took us five days to lock up. Um, again, it was December, it started um, snowing um, and got pretty cold, so could have gone a little bit faster. Next picture, please, Zach. So that's the inside, almost finished. Um, as you can see, usually we focus on the exterior shell. Um, in our house, we used uh, CRT as interior walls as well. So we never touched it again. We assembled it um, and never touched it again. So now no drywalling, no mudding, no painting. Um, and as I said, CRT, um, biggest advantage, I think, it's your structure, it's your finish, it's your vapor retarder, um, it's your airtight layer, and you don't have to touch it anymore if you don't want to. Um, and the structure, pretty simple, you can see the big drop beam um, in the middle. So there are two posts and it rests basically on two posts and the exterior walls. Um, next picture. Yeah, that's another pic from the inside. Um, as I said, the, the wall that you see in the back is the um, east wall. So the window was built in, which you will see soon on, on a little um, time lapse. Window was built in, insulation was on. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is where I'm originally from and where I have um, good friends that are carpenters and that have a shop. So I went over there last October and we loaded four containers in um, two days, basically, or three days. Um, again, here you can see the inside of one wall as I said, CRT, solid wood fiberboard, strapping, and wooden siding in this case. Gaskets were on uh, and we attached um, the corners and assembled it with um, dovetail connectors, uh, type recon. That's a rich detail. So we used the, the um, trailer box gaskets as well. Um, and I have to say everything fit. We didn't cut one piece on site. Um, again, five days to lock up, um, maybe next slide. So this is the shop in Europe, in Slovenia, um, with all the walls lined up and you can see the siding, it's a pre-stained gray siding, um, solid wood fiberboard and strapping. Next slide. So that's a time from our side. As I said, 10th of December in the Rocky Mountains, not the best time to assemble a house. Um, we were two months late, I have to say. This is why we ended up in December. But again, five days, um, we worked long days um, and it paid off. So all the windows and doors were built in except the floor to ceiling was on the south side. Um, because obviously there was no wall to build them in. <laughs> um, yeah, that's one, um, that's the east side, um, upper floor east side wall. 
Yeah, Windows built in, siding on. Um, the only thing we had to do later was um, attach the, the joints, the siding, which was delivered with the package. Um, unfortunately, we didn't, or fortunately, unfortunately, we didn't assemble the uh, prefabricated uh, roof panels uh, just because of size and volume. Uh, we had cantilevered um, glue lamp rafters. So this is how it looked like for another month, unfortunately, um, on the roof before we put down the um, solid wood fiberboard installation and uh, the um, roofing. Yeah, I think that was the last picture. Is there one more, Zach? No. Oh, that was the last one. Yeah, so Thank you, Thomas. we got the... Um, again, we started 10th of December and we moved in in May. Um, we have pretty much done everything works, um, except as you can imagine, baseboards and the huge. Um, but everything works and uh, we are pretty happy. So we're hitting the minus 15 degrees now and um, it's, it's good. So again, we don't um, manufacture anything. Um, we use different suppliers from Europe for CRT so far. I hope there will be more suppliers in North America that we can um, use. Um, other than that, we plan design um, to a high level um, and we can push the limits with windows built in, siding on, insulation on, if the clients want to. That's from me. Thank Perfect. you. Thanks, Thomas. Beautiful stuff. Love the detail, the gaskets, and even again, the CLT, how tight it was there. That's fantastic stuff. So um, I'm sure there'll be some more questions for you afterwards. I saw them in the chat okay. building up. So now we're off to Build Smart with Paul Griovic. Paul, your turn. Yes, I believe Mary had a video to play. There it is. At BuildSmart, we're not in business to replace the local design professional or builders or developers that are still out there practicing their trades. We want to be a tool, a tool that helps them deliver on the promise of improved energy efficiency, no matter what climate zone they're in or what performance thresholds they aspire to. Listen, the way we are building right now with the Build Smart system is beautiful. I don't think we will ever consider any other way of building. The way it goes up, the way it goes together, the way it's tight, the, the energy qualities of it, it's the best system I've ever seen in my life. trainees that had never touched construction before and there were things that we had to do from the grading and everything making sure that it's level because of the components and the way it comes together like a big jigsaw puzzle you are able to take less skilled individuals bring them to the site show them what needs to be done and in the repetitious of doing it one after another one after another you can assemble a larger project with less difficulty than you would if you were doing full stick built in conventional construction. Paul, did you have a few more things to say about? Yeah, amazing company. Um, yeah, last time, Sean, you mentioned that the uh, uh, point of Passive House Accelerator is to make the economic pie larger for all of us. And I have some information uh, that uh, should be able to show on the screen, but it's not coming through, so I'll just talk through it. Uh, basically, I've given this paper at about a dozen conferences across the U.S. and maybe two or three times that for AIA presentations. I'll supply anybody who wants a copy of it. Basically, it's a, it's a financial analysis for prefabrication and multifamily. And uh, 
applicable to anybody doing prefabrication multifamily passive house. And essentially, uh, you end up at the end of the process. Um, and this is all backed up with articles and such. I didn't make it up. Uh, basically showing that you're spending 4.8% less for a, a passive house apartment building uh, prefabricated than if you stick built it to code and you're making 60% more cash flow on, on the operation of the building. So I'll just leave it at that. Anybody want a copy of the paper? Just let me know. Great, right, Paul. Thanks for the info. We'll uh, maybe again come back in the question period for the details, but again, appreciate that, that insight. And going to move along to Eddie Dillman from B Public. Hey, thanks. So I'm going to um, thank everybody for being here. Another amazing event at the Accelerator. Thank you to Mary and Zach and Sean. I am Edie Dillman. I am one of the co-founders of B Public Prefab. Next slide, please. So we were, um, we incorporated in 2019 and center to this company coming into the market was Passive House as our path forward. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Be Public is a public benefit corporation addressing the housing need, energy consumption, environmental impact of construction, with a dedication to building science. Our wall, roof, and floor panels offer building envelopes for backyard studios all the way to low rise multifamily developments. Currently, we have 49 interchangeable components in a range of R values, fully insulated, vapor open, airtight to serve projects from climate zones two through eight. Next slide, please. Um, so this is gonna be a brief um, uh, presentation just about sort of our fundamental um, beliefs and what we're working on in um, this new venture. So we're all about removing barriers um, or at least limiting them to making great decisions and moving towards uh, high performance building. So next slide, if you would. Uh, a perfect example of this is contractors. They're our heroes. We are here supporting local builders to build faster, to increase finished projects every year, um, and a simplified path to performance. So working with builders in partnership with either our home plans, our licensed home plans, or the plans that they have or their clients have. Next slide, please. Um, we're working to decrease barriers in the design exploration. Next slide. We provide tools for architects and designers to play with B public components from day one. So offering related application details and options to allow for more open exploration for all size projects. And what does that mean? It means we support and we collaborate with professionals with ongoing envelope modeling and technical assistance from schematic design all the way through a project. Next slide. Addressing barriers in equal access. Um, next slide, would you? So this is the big picture issue and this is um, you know, a, a future issue and I hope everyone on the call and certainly everyone presenting um, is working on these issues. Um, this is a movement and we are just at the beginning of it in the US and North America. And we believe that homeowners at all income levels should have the ability to make choices for building resilience. Next slide. Reducing barriers around cost. Cost predictability is really um, something that we are focused on. Sorry, next slide. We are a component-based company. We are a component-based pricing model. So it is for iterative design and design and decision-making. We're estimating early, and I hate to say it to my team, early and often through the planning process and all the way through uh, the development of a project. So tools for communicating to the client, to the builder, to partners, 
around high performance. And you can see in this example, models of projects under design development. And these go along with our estimates so that there's always a visual and an understanding of what that building envelope is when we provide costs. Next slide, please. Um, we're also looking at the hidden savings and efficiencies in designing with standardized panels. You can see with our, um, our model on the right-hand side, um, our flat roof panels at that 10 foot interior ceiling height may not be for every project, but it clearly offers a faster, efficient path for many projects. Next slide, please. So eliminating barriers to carbon savings or around our carbon footprint. Next slide. Passive house gives us a path to operational carbon savings, but we must also address the embodied carbon as well. And we do so by offering carbon sequestering assemblies. This graph is from a multifamily development we're working on now. And it really outlines the balance when we both pair carbon, carbon sequestering and operational carbon uh, footprint. Next slide. And our last point about barriers, although there are many more that we're addressing at Be Public, the ones we've talked about, what does it mean when we remove barriers? It means that we are a positive disruption in the marketplace. And last slide. So Be Public, we have standardized a predictable Lego-like system. We also license our beautiful home plans. We design and sell our panelized building envelopes. And importantly, we support architects, designers, builders, and developers to work with our panels and prioritize better buildings and decision-making. So we work in very creative ways to remove these barriers. And we have built this company to put quality and craftsmanship at the forefront and predictability of comfort costs and carbon savings available to the public. Thank you so much. I look forward to Q&A afterwards. Thanks, Eddie. And I saw that someone post uh, a January 12th webinar that we'll make sure we also help out and promote for you as well. So great stuff. Now we belong to David Barnett from Tag Panels. Hey guys. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, David, uh, one of the co-founders of Tag Panels. We're based in Squamish. Uh, I'm also an architect and a passive house designer, uh, owner of Stark Architecture. Um, next slide. Yeah, so tag panels, similar to some of the other panelists here, they're prefabricated sustainable building panels, enabling clients to meet the high performance building goals. Um, our kind of secret sauce, as we like to call it, is that we're co-founded by an architect, an engineer, and a contractor. Uh, next slide. Uh, the build up, um, we've created a typical wall assembly. It's a bit of a misnomer because we customize them to each job, but we're from the inside out, we're going for OSB or plywood as our air barrier and vapor retarder, uh, blown silos or a knot for the timber stud cavity, wood fiber to the outside, a high performance WRV, and then the strapping uh, is shipped with the strapping on, on top. Next slide. We also do alternative build ups. Um, <clears throat> This was a Larson Trust system uh, project that we did. Um, we wouldn't, you know, we've, we've had some experience, but we, we really believe the two by uh, stud wall is the best for transport and uh, simplicity and cost. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so this is a little uh, shot of our current operation. Uh, we started in a 3000 square foot shop and we outgrew that within the first project. Um, this is a 10,000 square foot shop. Um, we've got a three ton gantry crane that runs 70 feet along the, the length of the shop. We have two separate tables that we can run two jobs at the same time or more often than not one twice as fast. And then we actually bring in the semi trucks back into the space and the, the piles of panels are loaded onto the trucks in reverse order, obviously, and then shipped out as and when needed. Um, we have a Crendel insulating blowing machine. We've got a total of 13 staff at the moment, designers, production, and then an install crew. And then we have an additional 15,000 square foot shop coming online this summer. Uh, next. Yeah, just some <clears throat> images of the guys installing. You know, we're really big into the 
the care and the precision and it really helps when they're in a dry shop which i'm sure you guys are all up to speed on now uh we can go to the next slide yeah and our process similar to others um we go through the needs first so that those are typically from the architect or a thermal model uh, to work out our values and sort of what we need for the envelope we then move into the modeling stage which is in we use CAD work software it takes about two to four weeks we then do things which take about a week um quite troublesome getting architects and engineers to actually fully coordinate everything. They say they do, but they don't. And I can attest to that. Um, then we go into fabrication. So we're approximately 20 days for a 4,000 square foot kind of custom home. And then in installation varies between 10 and 20 days, depending on the complexity. Uh, next slide. Um, materials, we're big into carbon sequestering as well. So we've tried to build the panels so that they have the wood fiber and the cellulose. We're, um, experimenting with NOF uh, recycled glass. It's not as good carbon sequestering, but it's also lighter because we're experiencing some of these panels um, are getting really, really heavy when we're lifting them because we're trying to shoot for the larger panels. Next slide. Uh, air barriers, so similar to some of the other panels here, we're kind of going for a multi air barrier approach, but our primary air barrier is the tape OSB or plywood to the interior. But the more the merrier when it comes to air barriers and tightness. Uh, next slide. And then vapor diffusion, which was touched on before. So these are vapor open, they're breathable. Um, we have be interesting to talk afterwards, but we have had problems with local authorities trying to get their heads around vapor open and you know certain code requirements requiring specific perm ratings and materials. And so I'd be interested to see what other problems people have run into there. But we're facing some of those. Uh, next slide. And I just got a couple of projects. So this one's currently being built in Worcester at the moment. It's a six and a half thousand square foot house. Um, we did the walls, floors, and the roofs here. It's all sloped roofs with sloped top walls, lots of steel in here. So quite a tricky build. Um, but this one has to be a step four house. Uh, next slide. Um, <clears throat> this one's in Worcester again. You can see at the top of the screen there's the um, CAD works model um, and some various photos of the construction and then a kind of final lockup one on the top left. What was interesting was this was a from start to finish a 19 day install including this uh, steel and there was five neighbors here and not a single one of them managed to finish their uh, timber framing before we got the roof on. So it really shows you the kind of speed and benefit there. Uh, last slide. And this is a house in Declula, 4,000 square foot, very tricky site right by the ocean. Um, yeah, this was, this was primarily chosen because of the limited local trades. Uh, we teamed up with some local guys, but they just didn't have the volume of people to build a house this size. So the panels made a lot of sense. And then last slide, I promise. The, this one's in Pemberton. So this is a Larson Trust system. Um, 3,000 square feet. We did all the glue lamb work and uh, really a race, race against time to get the roof on before the snow. Uh, but again, this was sort of like 15 days from sill plates to the final roof going on. Um, yeah, and upcoming, we've got the multifamily area is a big new market for us. We're seeing lots of people reaching out with 100, 150 unit multifamilies and <clears throat> custom homes are great, but they come with their own quirks. Um, and I think that the real power is going to be in these multifamilies um, doing those sorts of things. Yeah, and happy to jump in questions on architectural or technical at the end. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, David. And again, we can uh, dive into some specific details on that Whistler project tomorrow on the Passables Accelerator Construction Tech event. So thanks, David, for letting me uh, uh, pull your arm to come back again tomorrow. So thanks for that. And now we're off to Graham Finch. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everyone. So I'll just uh, jump in. You want me to share that or? Yeah, perfect. All right. All right. Um, I'm going to finish things off here by uh, getting the group maybe to think ahead and what's coming next. We've had a lot of great presentations, a lot of talk about uh, multifamily and, and what that means. And I'm going to talk about high rise buildings. Okay. Next slide. 
So we have a number of unique things coming together, especially in on the West Coast. Um, this has been really exciting for the last number of years. It's kept me very busy during COVID. Uh, I should mention that RDH does, isn't a panelized um, wall or facade producer. We work with a lot of companies to help them, but we aren't actually producing these ourselves. So we're going to share today is stuff we've done with others. But uh, what's really exciting is we're seeing a whole bunch of things come together, especially for larger buildings. Next. First is height, right? If you're looking at tall buildings and getting and getting to access to these buildings, you you often don't have scaffolding. So you think of panels flying in, you know, basically clicking into place and, and sealing into place. So it's developing uh, systems and seals and joints in particular that allow you to do that without any access for tapes or sealant from the outside uh, and try, trying to move all the control layers to the inside and, and trying to do that with structural connections. Uh, from a practicality standpoint, we're seeing uh, this to be necessary, especially in larger markets, places like uh, the Bay Area, it's just too expensive to build anything, um, as many people can probably attest there, and a lot of other cities. So uh, we're looking at prefab to solve at least, or solve or at least provide some labor cost certainty. And the last is environmental. We're seeing you know more and more levels of insulation, increased levels of air tightness, and low carbon, which is putting a lot of things in the same basket. And what it is, it's pushing, it's pushing us to be more creative to, to get some uh, control on the systems, but also, you know, it's a lot easier to install, you know, 10 inches of insulation on the ground indoors than it is on the side of a 30 story high rise. Next. The hmm. other catalyst we're seeing right now <clears throat> is mass timber and mass timber is unique that it's driving this even further so when we're talking about doing prefabrication for high rises before it was you know becoming a given it isn't given in many markets but when you look at the mass timber building uh, which is driving a lot of this lately it has to go fast for moisture protection and also just the speed of the structure is quite quick so you want to keep up with it and so that's what's driving a lot of this change recently next Two things to consider, you know, existing systems, we have small panels, like things like window wall and small precasts that can be installed um, from small cranes, you know, things like curtain wall would be installed like this with small cranes on, on the off the slab edge of the building. Next, it's a very large panel systems. And so this is where a lot of the development is going uh, with panel systems is where actually walls with the windows integrated. Next. There's a number of existing solutions already. This isn't new. Uh, prefabrication has been around for a long time. Uh, we can prefabricate out of concrete. We can do it out of steel studs. We can do it out of curtain wall. And when we talk about passive house, it means pushing the uh, pushing the envelope, so to speak, on in terms of thermal performance. So it means thicker amounts of insulation, uh, more exterior insulation with steel, thicker sandwich panels, or more insulation in concrete, and higher performance curtain wall systems. Next. There's a huge opportunity. Uh, we have a number of projects, passive house projects in the city of Vancouver underway. And the only way that they're gonna be able to be built cost effectively is incorporating uh, a fair amount of prefabrication. So, you know, right off the bat, looking at steel frames, you know, HSS frames with pre-installed windows, all exterior insulation uh, to control thermal bridging. And then it's all about how you connect these together and what that looks like when it's connected. So doing very complicated uh, passive list projects like the one on the left here. Next. And where we're going next is actually into mass timber facades. There's been a lot of uh, interest in bringing wood into to larger and taller buildings with mass timber. Uh, and so we see mass timber structures going up all over the place. And what we're really pushing on the enclosure side is how we do the facade systems out of mass timber. Uh, and we're looking at you know a couple of different approaches, whether it be a hung panel, like we see on the, the illustration here, which is essentially what we call curtain wood, which is like curtain wall, but hung wood. So very thin uh, wood panels, whatever it's CLT or mass plywood panel or their components uh, or load bearing. Uh, and one of the things, you know, when you look at <clears throat> hung systems, they're not part of the load bearing structure, but they're purely a facade element. Next. Uh, and the way these systems are working, you know, very similar to uh, a lot of the technology we use in steel stud and precast is, you know, your wood panel, whether it be CLT or plywood or whatever component, uh, large and strong uh, in uh, factory installed air 
Uh, on water resistant barriers, typically vapor permeable membranes, uh, whether it be a sheet applied or fluid applied. Windows installed to meet the specs. Exterior insulation, so you can leave the wood exposed on the inside, but also for durability. Uh, and then your cladding and your finishes and everything's on site. And all the, the trickery comes into the, the joints and details. Next. Um, there were some build slides there, but um, Catalyst uh, in Spokane by uh, Katera, designed by Michael Green, was one of the first larger examples of this uh, in the US. Two story tall, 30 foot, uh, 30 foot tall by about eight foot panels that came together on site. Uh, the cladding and windows weren't pre-installed because the cladding was terracotta and the windows were uh, too large to, to lay, out, lay down flat and, and then tilt up. But it's in the first example of that there. Uh, next. Uh, and where we're going next, and I want to talk a bit about this project, Canada's Earth Tower project is a uh, proposed 30 to 40 story passive house mass timber project in, in Vancouver, British Columbia. And the, the competition part of this project was for teams across Canada and the US, and, and I reached out to many people out here on the call and we probably talked a few times. Uh, the idea was <clears throat> we needed a team to develop a mass timber facade for this building, for this project, and would meet a passive house uh, design spec for, for thermal insulation, air tightness, um, you know, be cost effective, uh, meet all the fire requirements, performance requirements for a high rise. Uh, we had six teams from across Canada and the US enter the competition, six very strong, uh, you know, concepts. Three of those concepts uh, went to the next phase, uh, sort of a semi, Sort of, um, the, you know, so the three, the three uh, uh, sort of winning teams, and actually, in, in my eye, all three were completely uh, viable, uh, viable options. We have um, uh, mass timber with exterior insulation, ex partially exposed or fully exposed wood on the inside, windows pre-installed. Each of the each of the teams had slightly different connection um, and details, but essentially that. Uh, proved out that this could be done and we have tons of projects we're actually looking at right now before this one where we now have options. So we actually now have high rise mass timber uh, facade systems that are available in, in North America. Uh, and the three, the three winning teams uh, were Katera, Element 5 and Sidewalk Labs. And uh, we'll be going forward next with the, the next phase here and then the uh, uh, this project will be eventually built uh, with one of those systems here. So next. So that's it. But uh, there's a big, big horizon ahead, big buildings and a uh, whole other thing to think about here. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Graham. I think we got Travis. Travis, are you there? Perfect. There we are, Travis. Great. Okay. Let's get it. You can go ahead and introduce yourself. I think Zach's going to try to uh, queue up your slides, but say That's hello. Right. Yep. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. I'm sorry. I want to apologize. If you, I guess I didn't realize you maybe tried to get me up earlier. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Travis Tool. I'm a builder uh, in Western Massachusetts in the Northeast US. Um, and studied NIP zero design and um, recently partnered with uh, Peter Jensen and formed a relatively new company here called uh, Build with Nature. Um, and we are representing the eco cocoon system. So if you want to go ahead and play that video, Zach will follow up with one right after. Often underestimated, straw hides a real treasure. Its unique cellular structure full of tiny air pockets makes it a great insulation material. Straw has been used in construction for millennia, but can it meet the high requirements of modern construction? Our wall panels consist of 98% wood and straw in their natural state. We want to show how well-known natural materials can constitute the building blocks of any sustainable construction. The wooden frame provides structural support for buildings up to six stories high. The panels are filled with straw at very high pressure. This helps achieve excellent insulation properties. Together with a wood fiber layer, an airtight membrane and an interior clay plaster, the system meets the strict requirements of the passive house standard. 
The system is airtight but vapor permeable. It allows excess humidity to escape and with no thermal bridges, it leaves no space for drafts or mold that is often present in modern sealed buildings. To accommodate any type of building design, the panels are made to measure for every project. With superior indoor air quality and a positive climate impact, EcoCocon provides a healthy and sustainable alternative to conventional construction. All right, great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so uh, we are, um, let's see, I guess uh, we'll just start with a little bit about the background. Um, so after 15 years of passionately seeking and implementing the most sustainable building practices uh, in various climates around the world, Peter Jensen, uh, the director of our company, Build With Nature, has uh, settled in upstate New York. Um, but coming to the Catskill region is not an end to his journey, but a new beginning. And uh, he's originally from Denmark, but uh, brings big, he's uh, bringing big plans with his vision uh, and hard earned expertise to create new opportunities for the US market. Since reaching out to his colleagues and old friends at the Slovakian manufacturing co uh, company, Eco Cocoon, over a year ago, uh, Jensen to offer their straw-based panels uh, as a prefabricated option for builders and designers across the US and Canada. The Eco Cocoon product and building system uh, has been based on rigorous testing certifications and hundreds of quality builds in 21 countries and has grown through renowned throughout the world since 2010. Um, until and the uh, in the fall of 2019, uh, getting right to work on our mission, Built with Nature designed and built the first Eco Cocoon prefab building in the United States. Uh, it was a small 300 square foot house set up as a case study and spec home for sale. Um, it, this is a, you know, t t as a tangible domestic example of the innovative method. And under the leadership of Jensen, the project was organized as a cooperative effort of 18 different companies and uh, documented on the Discovery Channel feature, Living Off the Grid, um, which you can find on our homepage, uh, buildwithnature.us. Thanks to its uh, unique structure, uh, or I guess uh, you could just switch the slide there for me, Zach. Um, thanks to this uh, unique structure, straw has been used in construction for thousands of years. Combined with modern technology, straw allows us to build sustainable, passive, energy efficient buildings. The cocoon panels are made of 98% natural renewable materials, making them as close to nature as possible. Uh, the best comfort and indoor climate can now be easily achieved through a combination of straw and clay. Governments around the world have decided to achieve a, car a carbon zero economy by 2050. And we are helping to make that a reality today by applying the absolute highest standards of passive house design with renewable materials. With 10% of the straw grown in the US each year, we could build 1.3 million homes and store a vast amount of CO2 rather than release it to the atmosphere. Um, so if you could switch that one more time, Zach. Uh, so just a little bit more about the uh, panels. Um, this is a uh, really adaptable to any size. Uh, they're customizable dimensions down to a millimeter. Um, it's very simple and quick assembly using basically uh, just a screw gun. Um, they're very flat and hom hom homogeneous uh, surfaces. Um, A panel, uh, which is standard, uh, just under 16 inches thick, uh, gives you an R38.3. Uh, with the wood fiber layer that we typically use, a two and a quarter or two and three eighths inch uh, wood fiber layer, that brings it to an R47. Um, as I said, the uh, panels are highly CO2 positive. Uh, so, you know, we can't, um, we can, justify for a certain period of time uh, transporting them 
across the ocean because they're currently uh, manufactured in Europe uh, to, um, because you'd, we've uh, done some studies and you'd need to truck over uh, 3,730 miles to achieve a negative CO2 output. Um, that's about 165 pounds of CO2 per, uh, sequestered per square meter uh, in the panel or eight tons in an average house. Um, so we're, our goal is to uh, bring these into um, you know, the mainstream and uh, have it as a uh, vi viable option for designers and builders across the states and um, eventually move toward manufacturing. Uh, it's a cradle to cradle certified product, a passive house certified component, um, is, um, fire resisting, uh, tested, seismic tested. Um, and yeah, I guess uh, if you want to switch that one more time. So I think the final builder um, team of designers could basically become a prefab uh, company using this system uh, today. Uh, if, as long as you can get access to a barn or a warehouse, uh, you can put these panels together with siding on, windows on, and have a very high quality uh, passive house ready prefab system. Great. Thanks, Travis. Glad you yeah. got an opportunity to talk about your stuff. And again, thanks for uh, letting us use your uh, some of your pictures for our promo material. So appreciate that. Okay, we're going to get into the question period. We've got a whole bunch queued up. Thank you to the presenters and to our sponsors. And as Mark said, you know, we need to, you know, to celebrate more. So sure, let's cheers everybody. Hopefully you guys are drinking something you're fancier than water, but it is what it is. Um, we, uh, the first person to kick off the question period is Jeff. Jeff, you ready? Yeah, sure I am. Um, so this is a question for actually, it's open to all the prefab, um, manufacturers, I, one of the things I've noticed is that all of your factories are set up to build flat and then you tilt stuff up and, and like do stuff with it. Why is everything built flat? Now, I appreciate you leaving it open to everybody. Um, why don't we go to Paul on that one? Because he's doing more multifamily. So we'll get Paul to start with that one and then we'll see who else wants to jump in. Paul, I'm putting you on the spot. All right. Well, he raises a good question. And it's largely for us, it's an ergonomics question. And so we keep devising all these different ways to get it vertical uh, as fast as we can or as easily as we can. But he's absolutely right. Uh, but it's it's not trivial to, to avoid it. Yeah, I'd add to that also there's the issue of gravity that when you're working with these materials and you're layering them, uh, you have gravity working to your benefit when you're horizontal. So you basically have your stud layer in our case, and you set OSB on that. You don't have to index it. You don't have to hold it in place. Gravity holds it in place while you nail it and so on with the additional layers. So, I mean, there's ergonomics and, you know, a lot of the machinery is just built that way uh, to begin with. Okay. So it's kind of a limitation of the machinery that's available to you guys to use. Yeah. That's why we've devised some of our own to, to get vertical. Well, it seems vertical would be better for a number. I mean, I understand the, the, the fight against gravity. Gravity tends to define a lot that we deal with, but um, the space savings, the, uh, the ability to um, add fenestration. I mean, you know, with glass, you don't, if it's vertical, it's actually the most stable. It just seems there are a tremendous amount of benefits. And you well, yeah, we put our windows in on stuff. a vertical panel. Sure. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. So, I mean, not everything happens vertically. There's a certain amount of the process that happens uh, horizontal and then it tilts up vertical for a remainder of the processes. So flashing happens vertically, window installation happens vertically. Uh, so you're absolutely right about that. And can, can some of the other uh, prefabricators uh, sort of uh, give us their perspectives on these things? Yeah, what we, if uh, Bill or Thomas, Thomas, you're ready to yeah. go. So our, our house was actually manufactured vertically, um, but that was mainly due to um, shop size and 
um, yeah, the layout of the shop. So they put the CRT panels into the shop vertically, applied the wood fiber board vertically. So starting obviously with the lowest row and installed the windows. So it can be done. It can be done, yeah. Again, it does depend on the factory. I don't know if Bill, if you're with us still, if you wanted to chime in, but I think you might agree with Paul when it, it comes down to manufacturing some of the machines. Bill left, but Martin is still here from the ah, Thanks, Martin. <laughs> Uh, I agree with Paul. We do the same thing. The framing, <clears throat> the sheeting, the insulation actually work, uh, is done horizontal. And then we turn into vertical and that's where all the MEP and the window install and the flashing happens. So it's gravity. It's also um, limitation on the equipment and also easier because we are not only framing eight foot walls, we are framing 10, 12, 14 foot walls and if you have different heights, your machines operate easier horizontal than vertical. Mm -hmm. So I want to say one last thing about uh, Travis and the straw bales, and that is that he didn't mention this, but it's really important. The fire proper, the fire rating properties on those straw bales that they manufacture is amazing. So if you're looking for a, it, it just so talk to Travis about his fires. Uh, prevention uh, properties on those uh, panels they make. Yep. Thanks for that, Jeff. Appreciate All it. Right. All right, Jeff. Travis owes you beer next time he sees you. I'm done. <laughs> oh, good. No good. All right. Uh, Steve Hasler had a question. Steve, you still with us? I am. I don't remember which question it was, though. He had a bunch of them, but go ahead. Uh, I think I was interested in uh, Geologic, what the radius would be for delivery. Okay, Alan, over to you. We, we, we say our build territory is the Northeast US. Um, and, you know, we could talk about going farther, but it just comes down to cost and getting the crew there and all of that. Great, thank you. Thanks, sure. Steve. Do you have another question, Steve? Are you happy with just that one for now? Uh, I'm good with that right now. Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, then we're over to um sorry chris from san rafael was that my question about uh prefab factories you had a few of them i go ahead and fire with one chris i, I got I, think, I, I, I got mary helping out with questions so I, I don't know exactly i just know you were in the queue next yeah i think i think that's what it was um yeah it'd be real interesting to be able to tour a factory um, and I don't know if there are any in the Bay Area, because I can imagine this is not exactly the cheapest place uh, to have such an operation. But uh, does anyone know of any? Well, there was one in Vallejo that I know of, but it went out of business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, there's a few that have gotten COVID. Um, but Chris, we'll, tr we'll try to get you some new ones, but some of these other ones do target your market as well. So um, again, I don't know if anyone wants to, if anyone's focused on California yet, but I'm sure. I, I mean, I know they do builds out here, but the actual fabrication would be uh, really interesting and educational to see. Um, so if anyone's doing that, out this way and uh, I'd love well, to get a chance to go see it. I went on a tour in Oakland of a company called Mighty Buildings. Very, um, it's uh, 3D printed buildings. Um, the building materials, as you can imagine, are different from the ones that we see here for the most part, but you can go tour that factory. It was a very interesting tour. Okay, I'll hit you up, Mary for info. Thank Chris, you. And I, and I think we're lucky too, is as we learn through COVID, again, we can have a presentation like we had tonight where, you know, individuals can show off their manufacturing needs. And, and so you could just stay where you are and teleport to all these lovely sites. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next in line was Shannon. I'm remembering to unmute. Thank you, Sean. Thanks to everyone for the presentation. That was amazing. I uh, learned a lot and I'm super psyched to try all of them now. <laughs> um, 
Um, I my first question was for Elka. She gave a presentation about a project I was involved in, but I was curious about the testing that occurs in the factory, especially during the window installation. Yes, hi. So I don't know if Martin wants to chime in as well, but um, I mean, it's not really that um, there's a testing chamber that's set up to pass, test every um, single window that is being installed. But when we did the um, installation of the windows of your projects, we actually had uh, representatives from, from Zola and from Ziga there who really just kind of got into the, the details of how to tape everything and, um, you know, to make it all fit and airtight. And when we did the, um, the lower door test for, for your building, it was pretty clear that the, um, there was no leakage around the windows there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. The other question that I had was for Alan. Um, I really liked the fact that they're doing the deep energy retrofits as well. He mentioned that they did a cost comparison with that case study, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, we didn't do a cost comparison per se from like a, a conventional retrofit to a passive house retrofit. Um, we didn't do a lot in the feasibility study about pricing, but that would come later. It was more about, is this building um, structurally sound? Could we renovate it with panels on the exterior? And that we found out would be possible. So it's still, um, yeah, it's in development for sure. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Uh, Harvey, you had a whole bunch of questions. So maybe I'll give you two. I don't know if I can only do two. Well, I'm giving you two, my friend. I'm, no, I'm, I'm, work, I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, everyone, a great presentation. Mine, mine were just uh, were, were really basic. One was, do you offer training? Um, because it's a, it's not really conventional um, for some of the trades, as I'm sure people have been writing in the in the chat. And the other one was just to guarantee um, air tightness. And what are the proprietary um, assemblies that you have or wall assemblies that when the panels are going together that it really does it's not a lot more work I know I think David you had said that you do a you you recommend maybe an exterior air barrier but just curious on on, on those two fronts thank you uh, Sean and is this open to anyone who would like to speak about it it wasn't directed to anyone specifically it was a I was following after Jeff Roden's uh, kind of deal. Yeah, I, I could uh, respond to that one. Uh, if you guys can hear me. Anybody? Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, we are definitely offering training and uh, want to be, um, you know, off and on site training as much as possible and uh, really just get this system out there in, in the hands of builders and developers, architects. Um, so please reach out to us on that front. And uh, what we uh, use is a, um, a vapor uh, or an air barrier uh, from 475 typically or um, something similar. And it's uh, just very uh, standard, you know, way to, way to do things if you were building any other high performance building. I'll just chime in there because I see a lot of air and water seals tried out through development and also in projects. I'd say that, you know, it's where prefab has failed in the past is where the joints have been, you know, with air leakage or, or water leakage, especially in larger buildings. And so it is something not to be taken lightly. And with the tapes and gaskets and sealant joints and silicone strips or, you know, curtain wall type joints, um, they're all different, they're all pros and cons. And it's about, you know, as the panels go together, you, is it either self-sealing or do you have to get there to do a transition? You know, one of the hardest transition is horizontal to vertical joint if you have multiple panels. Uh, if you can access the full, the inside of that versus the outside. So there's not one best system. I'd say that, uh, you know, you gotta look at each of the, where you can get to for the seal. There's lots of great tapes, lots of great seals that can be used, it's just, all about continuity and getting access to it on site. And can I jump in about uh, the training? 
I'm hoping that the dogs who have been wrestling next to me are going to be quiet for a second so I can answer. Um, but, you know, Be Public, like I talked about, is kind of different about um, our approach and, and training and onboarding uh, both architects and designers is, of course, key. Um, but really onboarding builders and, and supporting these local ecosystems. So um, we're very fortunate that we're partnering. Um, I put it in the chat. Um, our manufacturing is done at Collective Carpentry. Go team. Um, um, and we also have installing teams that have experience installing two Passive House standard panelized um, that we utilize. And our program with local builders is the first build we really ask that our approved install crews do that install, but that they tap somebody on the local crew that really is there to learn. So that the subsequent build would be public. There's somebody who's been trained and we can approve to install the next one. So it's really depending on the builder, depending on the projects that are building with us, that it's a sort of a stepping down in a way so that we're really training those local crews to do the install all the way through finish on our project. So um, that's that's key to what we're doing. Um, and of course, we're very fortunate that a lot of the builders we're um, connected to have done panelized that are already sort of in this community of passive house practitioners. Um, but we're working with some great um, projects some really interesting rural locations where there's nobody in sight that's ever done panelized or prefab. So it's great to bring those builders into the fold as it were and get them trained um, and ready to do serial projects with us. Is this like, it's, it's interesting, just as an aside, is that we're, we're taking a jump from conventional, or if you want to call it obsolete uh, construction practices, jumping over to passive house. And now with this, we're jumping into something new. It's, there's some massive leaps of knowledge and, and uh, experience in marketing that people are going to need. But uh, great presentation. Thank you guys for, uh, for answering my question. I appreciate it. Yeah, Harvey, it's a good point, right? You're bringing up passive house prefab and then some of us are also looking at the low embodied carbon so that's three that we're tackling at moving the typical platform frame construction to this higher level it's it's pretty fantastic that everyone's putting on their thinking hats to to make this happen it's it's exciting times for all so in the queue harvey you're you're happy come back and i'll i'll, I'll get you a couple more in the uh, in the oh, no, that was that was great i don't want to take up any more time thank you sean that was all good. Um, next, we have Scott Kennedy. Scott, you there? While he finds his uh, mute button, uh, Scott's also going to be featured on our happy hour on Wednesday. And if Scott has taken a phone call, then we are going to move on. Uh, I know Derek had to leave with us. And so the next one was um, Anna Gret. Hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. You had a question. Yes, thank you. I was just wondering, I saw so many assemblies with wood fiberboard. I mean, I'm familiar with it from Germany, but you know, that's always kind of a bit of of a challenging aspect of all these wall assemblies that you have to get the stuff from Europe. So, you know, I find it, you know, depending on where you are in the United States or Canada, and I mean, Canada has so much wood, it seems a bit redundant to bring that material into, into this market. So I guess is there, I know the advantages and I heard, and now someone had an, an a comment that there is a fa factory being set up in Maine, which would be closer than going over to Europe. Maybe someone can speak to that. I'm not sure. Yep, I, I know a little bit about that. Um, <laughs> it was a it was a spinoff of Go Logic, uh, and it's called Go Lab. And Go Lab has a mill and is you know in the process of starting production, which will hopefully be in the next year or two. So it'll be, it'll be rigid wood fiber. It'll be a wood fiber bat. It'll also be a blown in product. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, really excited about getting that produced. I mean, we are currently importing wood fiber um, from Poland and yeah, it's, um, would love to have a domestic source, but it's still such a great product. And as um, 
I think Travis may have said, you know, the shipping um, of a product like that, yeah, it, it doesn't make a lot of logical sense, but it carbon wise, it's still carbon negative when we get it and put it into a house. So for that reason, you know, we used to use mineral wool and someone asked about that. It's like mineral wool has really high embodied energy in the production. So other than, you know, besides being kind of nasty to work with, um, we moved over to the wood fiber. Yeah, and I guess a lot of people, I mean, I'm an architect in uh, Ottawa, Canada. So, you know, there's just not that much knowledge about that project other than in the um, passive house community, you know, like people don't really know it and understand it. So I think there's also, you know, all of us, <laughs> it's a lot of work to be done to, I mean, I work in mainstream architecture. I don't really have the chance to do much passive house yet. I hope that changes, but um, nice so there's a lot of education. Fiber. I think the nice thing with wood fiber board is you get you can get it in any size, in any thickness, in any density. It's uh, very easy to to assemble and fasten to the structure, and you can play with your R values or properties. I know. I mean, I'm from the Black Forest originally, so I mean, it gets produced there. So I mean, I'm familiar with yeah, it. From there you go. <laughs> it's not me you have to convince. It's okay. <laughs> well, no, and that's a good point. I mean, when you think of in North America, speaking out of Vancouver, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't have, you know, any passive houses. And now we have almost one popping up a month. But we also had, you know, five or six certified window manufacturers now. So Again, we're all eager to move this whole movement forward a thousand times. I mean, I would love that every house is, is being built as possible, but that dream is going to have to be, you know, have to wait a few more years. Uh, but when it comes to these other products, um, they will have to get made here locally. Just the demand for it needs to be there. And, and, and then, of course, stay at the factory. So you will definitely see some more of these locally made products sooner than we think. But again, thanks, Alan, for giving us an update on where, where they're at. That's great. And next question is uh, Christina. Oh, I'm just checking to see if Christina is still here. And was, um, oh, there we go. I'm going to jump in and say that was because I think it's a question that a lot of people might be interested in. How do you run the electrical inside the CLT panels? So I guess Thomas will fire that one to you. Yeah, so we ran the CRT, uh, the, the electrical, uh, we router the boxes for um, shallow um, electrical boxes. And then we have drillings from the bottom or if it's an interior wall, which is a little bit thinner, uh, we have channels all the way, which we cover later um, with, a, with a strip of um, CRT or a strip of wood. Yeah, but it's definitely, it, it takes a little bit more um, brain power and pre-planning um, if you leave the CRT exposed, that's for sure. And then we usually, um, so this is how we go vertically. Horizontally, we um, usually have a floor buildup, um, strapping where we run uh, um, wiring and plumbing and water lines and ventilation lines or ventilation pipes. Great. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Mary, for jumping in. The next one, I think Marcel had a, had a few questions. Marcel, go ahead and pick one. Hey, Sean. Thanks, guys. Great uh, presentation, everyone. Um, just the whole discussion with building officials. I know with an open panel, you can, there is ways to get around with that. But as some of you explore to do closed panels, adding more to the panel and maybe getting certification off the wall assembly from the building officials within your factories, like in Canada with PCSA approval. I don't know how that works in the States. Who wants to start with that? I could maybe start off with that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we, the workaround that we have at the moment is that we have a structural engineer on, on staff who signs off on the structural buildup. And then we typically, we run the gauntlet with local authorities where they don't understand that they need to be fully signed off so we get lucky somewhere and then in some cases where the when the building authority knows exactly what's going on we get the architect to issue a schedule b that signs off on the envelope 
and we've just had one in Delta where the inspector didn't even inspect, uh, accept that. So we're actually now looking to get CSA approval for our factory. And once we get CSA approval, we can manufacture all of the panels and they have a stamp on them. And that then is a closed panel, which can be shipped to site and is approved by a building inspector. Is that an expensive and lengthy uh, process to get that approval? It was expensive and lengthy to try and figure out how they do it, because it seems to be a closed shop. But essentially, I've been given the figures of about $10,000 to have our facility inspected. And then every sticker costs 25 cents. And then they come every three months, which costs another $4,000. And uh, yeah, so I mean, it's something that we need for the larger multifamily. So we're going to get it anyway. But it is kind of interesting to me as an architect that some of our attempts have just prevailed because of the, the lack of knowledge of building inspectors. Um, I don't know what other manufacturers do. It's been, been a bit of a guessing game for me. Thanks, David. So I, I would like to chime in too, because in Pennsylvania, as soon as you have a closed wall, um, it actually falls under, under the IH, the uh, Industrialized Housing authority. So in that case, you actually need someone, uh, a third party, to come into the factory and uh, pretty much look at the panels while they're being manufactured. And this factory has to be, um, you know, they have to engage into a contract with this uh, kind of specific third party um, agency. And then um, once they kind of start the process, uh, they're going to review drawings and um, there's a lot of information that they want to see from the structure engineer and then they kind of put a stamp on it and then the uh, the lo local building inspector is going to accept that um, but then there's a whole kind of on-site or in the factory inspection during uh, manufacturing of the of the panels and then they also going to get a, a little sticker that says approved um, some townships or some inspectors are um, a little bit more, more, more lenient with, with that, but even the, the definition of what is a closed panel is a little, um, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's not very black and white. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Marcel. And if you missed it last week, Marcel brought some Canadian funk to our Passive House Accelerator Construction Tech. So. Thanks again for that, Marcel. Nice. Um, could I jump in on that one, Sean? Go ahead, Travis. Real quick. So, uh, yeah, our, um, our currently, you know, uh, the panels don't have any kind of uh, certifications in the U.S., but they've been, the eco cocoon system is so uh, rig rigorously tested um, that we have a lot of uh, different results for, um, you know, that we can represent to local building inspectors. And we also have, uh, an engineer that we work with uh, currently for the northeastern states in the U.S. Um, and we're looking to expand those relationships so that we can make it uh, more viable and uh, and get and working towards the testing uh, that's required to certify them here. I'll just add that uh, Canadian in particular, but also U.S. codes don't make it easy to uh, bring in great products so we, we we are the ones that get calls when manufacturers want to use new insulation membranes you know they're all great products but the authority have oh, yeah. looks to put up a lot of uh I don't, barriers to innovation so um oh, happy to help you out but uh you know the the simpler you can make it and the better you can explain it then uh, i find better success there but uh we try to get avoid you know avoid you know just stamping things just to get things approved. You got to make sure it you know, works, obviously. Uh, the big thing with high rises too, I mean, especially you're starting to see in your larger projects is, you know, there's full scale performance mock-ups where you're going to demonstrate air, water, structural tightness, fire. And so once you've gone through that full rigor of testing, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, then hopefully you get accepted, but uh, it, it's a long, long and expensive path to get there. So keep doing what you're doing pushing ahead, educating the authorities. That's uh, all you can do. Excellent, Graham. Thanks for adding that in. Uh, I didn't do this earlier, but other prefab companies that are listening in, say hello in the chat. I saw a few of them, so make sure you say hello. Um, also know that I saw 
um, Lauren Kelly, the uh, uh, business manager development for NA Structures, she's out there. So maybe we'll get him on the next uh, next show. So thanks for everyone. I'm here. For, for, perfect. Thanks, Lauren. How are you doing today? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's been my pleasure and I've enjoyed a lot of the content and I look forward to having an opportunity to contribute in the future. Perfect. Hey, um, Lauren, you just want to say where you're based just for so people can find you? Oh, certainly. Sorry. I did do that in a group chat thing earlier, but our factory is based in Quebec, Canada. I am based just north of Toronto and we do business in 14 countries. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Appreciate it. And again, yeah, if anyone else is there, make sure you say hello so we all can connect with you. Uh, so keep going on with the questions. Uh, we have Craig Stevenson is up next. And I'll try to update the chat because we've got Craig and then Christian, and Scott. Just checking to see if uh, Craig still- I think Craig's in. question got answered. So. Okay, all right, move along. Uh, Christian K from LA. Mary, do you have Christian's question by chance? It's you know, it's similar to what we were just talking about. Okay. He asked, when working with pre-assembled panels, how does the site inspection work with the local building inspectors? For example, sheathing, nailing, inspection when already covered and not accessible anymore. Gotcha. So yeah, I think we, we dove into that. Okay, we'll keep going here. Um, Scott H is next. Just checking to see if Scott's still with us. If I can not. jump in because I think this question is general enough. Um, do you use FSC wood? And I don't remember at the time which company he was talking about, but it's a good question, I think, for everybody if they want to answer it or anybody who wants to. I think most are using traditional, but anybody else using it or adding it in when a client's asked for it? So we as Holzom typically ask for using, you know, FSC certified wood and um, Blueprint Robotics definitely does that. So it's important for us because we've done some, some analysis on, um, you know, embodied carbon footprint and uh, whenever you use these calculators, it's kind of interesting because in general, you can't really claim your, your carbon um, you know, for wood, if, if you don't use any kind of sustainably, sustainably grown wood. So that, that is really important for us. Great. Thanks for jumping in, Elka. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure if someone's talking or not, but moving along. Uh, Laura Tugwell had a question. Laura, you still there? Yes, I sure am. Um, I think this has been touched on a little bit this evening, and um, if I understand, um, basically, okay, so let me start start over again. Um, my question is about um, any California um, or prefab passive house California or companies in California, and I believe that there is, um, well, Be Public says that they can service this area, North America, specifically zones two through seven, which includes California. And I guess their uh, PDX prefab is in Oregon, which is not that far away, especially when you compare it to like most things seeming to be on the East Coast. Um, but I'm wondering if there are any um, existing prefab passive house companies that, um, that are in California as of now. I think we talked about this a little bit and that um, none of us knew of any um, and as being with Be Public, I'll, I'll answer and I think it was answered in the chat that we are delivering to California. Okay. Um, manufacturing in BC, so um, it's an easy route for us, um, but no knowledge of anybody manufacturing locally yet. Um, soon. I'd give it about six months. <laughs> nice. I like Somebody that. Somebody on this call will be moving to California to serve you. 
Yes, please. That and like I, I fully agree about the um, is it the Gutex uh, wood fiber boards? We actually did a project at the company that I work with um, out in Carmel Valley that incorporated those lovely um, Gutex boards through 475. Um, but unfortunately, they did have to be shipped all the way from Europe, which is really ridiculous because we our trees are just as good as theirs, I believe. <laughs> So it's, it's but and just like so many things in this really um crunchy time right now it seems like it's actually expediting a lot of growth so um that's a good thing yeah thank you very much thanks laura also available to uh deliver to the panels to california and anywhere in the us or canada fantastic awesome thank you yeah, Laura, it's interesting too. I'll just, you know, we're all uh, growing the markets and everywhere we're at. Um, you know, the other thing that's happening too is you have some prefab builders that have just been doing, you know, two by six in plywood and trust like more of the component manufacturers. They soon will be jumping into this market and providing an opportunity there. So there's, there's a lot of things changing from people that are starting off, people that are well established and people that are going to maneuver to, uh, to take on this market share. So uh, and as soon as you asked, Laura, there's a bunch of people that jumped in the chat. So um, I wouldn't be surprised next year you'll have uh, an answer. And as Eddie said, within six months. So it's pretty exciting. Things are moving <laughs> fast. Oh, that's fantastic. And these days, six months goes by pretty quickly. <laughs> well, uh, for those that have been hanging out with the Passive House uh, Accelerator and our happy hour, you know, this week is 40 weeks that we've been doing that event. So I tell you, 40 weeks goes by pretty quick. All right, Laurie, thank you. We're going to move over to Rebecca. Rebecca, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Go ahead. I think you had a couple of questions. Uh, thanks, everyone, for putting together this summit. This has been um, really informative for me, a newer uh, person in this passive house space. And my question was just about um, the suitability of panels for um, including on a retrofit project. So kind of, you know, putting on top of an existing wood structure. Um, and I'm mostly interested, this is for um, a current project. So panels that would be available in the Vancouver market, the, the project's actually in Burnaby. Great stuff, Rebecca. I know we talk about, you know, energy sprung and, and the market, like we're mostly talking about new builds, but once we all can figure out a, a way of dealing with the richer fit market, I mean, we're gonna all have about 10 different factories so it's uh it's big um does anyone want to jump in on on things they're working on david is this something you want to talk about first uh yeah we, we've worked with uh, a company to look at prefab uh, retrofits and the, the panels do suit just because they can be clipped onto existing structures one of the structures we looked at in vancouver was a mid-rise concrete um and they're very suited to installing the panels to the exterior and being vapor open as well. There's a great benefit there in not kind of capturing or trapping any moisture. Um, I know, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little trickier, um, but I think there's a huge market, especially in the West End and areas like that in Vancouver. Yeah, actually, that's what I've found is most of them seem to be um, more applicable to, to concrete, to, um, to, applying to a concrete slab um but not necessarily to like a wood a wood frame structure like a house yeah the, the problem the is like, when we look to the timber structure it's just you run into all the new code requirements for structure so mm -hmm. although it stood for 60 years the code has changed so we can't clip it readily onto it so so logic had something can can mr gibson speak to that <clears throat> well, I was going to say, I, I, I think Canadians are a bit farther along than we are in, in uh, panelized retrofits. I've talked to a number of people. Um, you might want to look up the Pembina Institute because I know they've done, they're doing some work on that. Um, you know, the, the U.S., particularly New York State, got on board with the um, whole energy sprong thing, and they've tried to promote it and do... Um, you know, sort of contest for projects to, to my knowledge, nobody's actually done a panelized retrofit yet. They've done a bunch of sort of foam over masonry building retrofits. Um, but I'm, you know, we did this feasibility study on, on a, a 
three unit apartment building. And I hope it goes forward next year because we'll, we'll try out a panelized approach. I mean, I've done lots of conventional deep en energy retrofits, um, you know, the conventional way, but I'm much more excited about panelizing it. What are some of the challenges that you're experiencing? Oh, I mean, you know, you just, you have to get a project and you've got to do it and you got to figure it out. You know, it's like um, somebody's got to be willing to, to do this new thing and have you try it. Otherwise, I think technically it's not that hard. I mean, you have to, um, you have to do a laser scan of the building so you can generate a 3D model and then accurate shop drawings. And you have to get the structural stuff worked out. And then you have to build the panels and, you know, figure out how to attach them to the building and go from there. I mean, I don't see it as being, you know, codes, I, I could see that being an issue. I don't see it technically as being all that difficult. From a design perspective, I'll jump in on Alan. I really appreciate that. I, I would love to see the energy sprung and the fabrication movement get that retrofit piece solved. But even with the new construction we did, this was the first time we used a panelized system. And in exploring the different materials and trying to find the right manufacturer, it really helps to have a team that is going to also understand passive house, also understand how to look at your climate specific requirements and how breathable you need to be in that panel. And then, uh, you know, also the being able to weigh different options in the panels and different manufacturers is really key. So I, I think Elka, maybe you could speak a little bit to that. And then also, if you're a designer and you're looking at doing this process, the phasing piece. So we're used to doing phases of typical architecture where it ends in CA and CA now moves when you do panelization into CDs. <laughs> So you really have to back it all up and include that time in your design, your soft costs. So Ilka, I know that's a lot of a lot of information and two questions. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would definitely agree with like shifting the timeline. And I was I'm coming from the architecture side, and I was on the architecture side for the first pro uh, project that we did actually with Blueprint Robotics. And what we realized as an architecture firm is um, we actually should have set up our contract a little differently because we didn't know that um, actually the construction administration kind of shifts to the front because you're you're virtually building the building up front and um, so there's a lot of kind of um, working through, through um, just kind of design challenges up front, but you have the chance to do so, to do so, right? Because um, later on, you're just kind of stuck with 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 what's on site, and then your uh, uh, construction administration piece kind of uh, is pretty much just like, okay, what's what what are we going to do with this? Like it's problem solving. While if you're moving it to the to the front, you actually have the the capability of um, you know kind of implement implement your design goals uh, a little bit better than just dealing with what's already there. So I, I would definitely and whenever we take on a project, we we do talk to the, the architects and say there is um, you know we're not saying it's it's definitely not less work for the architect. But it shifts a little bit because there's a lot of uh, upfront just kind of working virtually through the building and just kind of looking through um, uh, drawings. But then that eases the way into construction and uh, administration by quite a bit. Yeah. And yeah, then like shop drawings to see if your design works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you have the, the control then. And I, I think that's what I like being uh, as the architect. And, uh, you know, I made that sp uh, the statement before as uh, being being a woman in the field. I think that that is definitely a piece that kind of gives you control on the architecture side, but also now being more on the construction side um, of just having a tool that, uh, you know, you can communicate with and that gives you somewhat of um, a voice. Thanks. Excellent. I th this is a great discussion and we can definitely carry it on in the, uh, in the afterwards. But first, we're just going to bring it over to Zach to wrap it up. 
Yeah, thank you, Sean. And thanks, everybody. This is really fantastic. Um, I want to say thank you to the summit sponsors, of course, for making tonight possible. So big thank you to Vapro Shield and to RDH Building Science for their support tonight. I also want to um, just remind folks uh, that we have a couple of, and are you able to see my screen? I'm, I'm uh, always uh, nervous about that. Yeah, it's all good, Zach. Okay, good. Thank you. So tomorrow, join us for Construction Tech Tuesday with David Arnott of TAG Panels uh, to dive deeper into to his process. It should be lots of fun. And then on Wednesday, join us for Global Passive House Happy Hour with Scott Kennedy and Gessa Zellerman of Cornerstone Architecture talking about the Heights Project. And finally, if you aren't yet, uh, I wanted to let you know that we have a Passive House podcast. And if you're not if you're not uh, subscribed yet or listening, please please check out this week's episode with Julie Torres Moskowitz. I'll share um, uh, links to all this in the chat. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. There are still about another seven or eight questions to be answered. So. Um, panel if you uh, need to run again thank you very much for for introducing all of us to you and answering questions for the last couple hours so thank you very much for those that uh are going to depart again thank you for joining us and uh and again we appreciate it so uh mary you had another question to kick us things off with well i just wanted to put this out as a general question to any of the panelists that are still around um just looking into the next year or two, uh, what would you need going forward? What would make the biggest difference to your business growing? And what are your expansion plans, if you have any, for the next year or two? All right, big question to kick off the overtime. Who wants to start? Local wood fiberboard manufacturer and more CRT manufacturers. Okay. Working on it. So, so again, we've got Alan and, and Geo, actually, sorry, Alan, the new company, I just saw it as Timber Go HP. Lab. Tim, Timber HP is what the product is called. All right, yeah. so we got that one in the process. Um, and I'm sure there might be more coming along. I know Kliznikov down uh, from, from NBC is also is starting some CLT. So again, the more the merrier. Anyone who wants to start up a company, it's you know only about 20 to $40 million, but just ask the bank, ask your mom and dad and get this thing started. We need it, it there's a demand for it. Um, well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna expand on a, a somewhat smaller scale, but um, I'm gonna go from our current space, uh, hoping to build about 20,000 square feet next year to use for expansion of our panelization production. So that's my plan. Excellent. That's great. Okay, going bigger. This is good. Okay. Uh, yeah, Sean. Um, so Eco Cocoon has uh, been ramping up their production. They're really like uh, maxing out there, but they have a plan to turn everything over to robotics or a fair amount of it and also uh, start um, production lines in each of the countries that they're currently working in. And so we would like to do that relatively soon here. Um, I think what we need going forward in this uh, country is just more uh, market demand and awareness about the availability of this as an option and um, connections uh, to communicate the um, importance of working with the oh. industry uh, to start things for Aussie Monkey product. Great, thanks Travis. And uh, just a note here, I saw Chris and I saw uh, Jamie from Sukup. So as these company grows, we also have some um, great manufacturers locally. So you can definitely go to Wyman or, um, you know, Bowtech, but we also have Sukup America here to offer equipment. So it's good to see things uh, available in the support world as, as, as well. So thanks to them uh, for, for being here tonight and answering some of the questions. It's great. Um, David, do you want to talk about your 2021 20, plans? Yeah, it's uh, just managing growth and we're in a lucky position in the sea to sky where I think we have about seven or eight projects for every time slot. So it's trying to manage that growth. Um, so we're, we've already tripled in size and we'll be getting another facility in the summer, moving towards some uh, multifamily. And then have, being an architect, I would just love if there was the building code was a little bit more flexible. Um, you know, it's a real 
not only do we have to educate the clients, and then sometimes we get educated clients, we have to educate the building authority. And that's a huge barrier to entry for any company who's trying to grow as fast as we all are. Um, you got a product ready to go out the door and then you get, you know, walls put up with building codes. So I think that's a slow process, but maybe some documents from RDH or I know Chris Hill's working on some stuff, anything that we can have as a piece of paper to wave in front of someone's face to say it's okay. That'd be great. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, David. Paul, what about you guys over at Build Smart? Well, to be candid with you, I don't relish having to acknowledge the elephant in the room. Let's put it this way. If the elephant does not control the Senate, we will have a lot of funding to build Passive House with. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, Eddie, how is, uh, what's the plans for Be, be Public for 2021? Yeah, it's going to be quite a year. I mean, um, I, I think Paul um, mentioned we may have some some great incentives and a lot of change coming. Um, you know, we're just we're just hauling as fast as we can, and we're really um, fortunate that the folks who are um, drawn to this work are sort of all in. Um, and I mentioned it in the presentation. You know, those local builders are really important to us. We have direct clients who are designing. Um, their own uh, be public houses. You know, it's the envelope is uh, predicted, it's um, set, but everything else can be designed around it. So we've got clients all across the country um, designing, and we need those lo local builders because part of what's sustainable and what makes this interesting is what happens in the field, right? Like you can clad it with whatever, whatever you want whatever roof line, but that um, needs to be a regional approach. So those partners in the field who understand what it is and really want to partner um, and, and add to the, the process is who we're looking for. Um, you know, uh, we're really excited about the design studios. Um, Shannon's question, um, I should have jumped in for, you know, onboarding studios. Um, I love, we have sort of an hour lunch and learn. And when we walk people through like, what is it all about? What are the components? What are the dimensions? What are we talking about? You can see when an architect goes, they, they lean into those details and they're like, hey, wait, it's not, you haven't just thought about the panels, you're thinking about the attachment to the foundation. No, you've, you've detailed seven different foundations. What, <laughs> right? So like taking the time to talk one-on-one -on -one with studios and with practitioners to see how we serve them. Um, and this goes back to Shannon's question. You know, we've done a lot of discovery in this last year. How do you work? And, um, you know, talking to uh, studios about how, how do they start a project? How do they put passive house or high performance um, on the table? Um, and we've developed tools so you can download our SketchUp tools and you have all the, the whole library of components and you can build your own envelope and literally play with the Legos. But I've joked with people, if you're still drafting by hand, I'll send you a pencil and we can talk it through. Like we'll meet you wherever you are because it's really fun. Everybody works differently and it should be creative. It should be iterative. Um, so we've got a lot of just, you know, great meetings ahead and a lot of beautiful builds coming up. Um, We've had snow, I'm in New Mexico. We've had snow, we have an install going up maybe on January 4th. So everyone, okay, it's the desert. We can't wish that there's not gonna be snow. That's a horrible thing to say, but uh, we'll be really excited to see some stuff get up and be sharing those projects. You know, it's been 2020 people, let's move, let's move it over to January for heaven's sakes. Yeah, yeah, I think we're all looking for uh, another 16 days to flip that calendar and, and, oh, and yeah. to a better, a better time. Um, Ilka, I don't think I gave you an opportunity to comment about what you guys are up to. Thanks, Eddie. Yeah, so we're definitely excited about the next projects. Um, we have one in Philadelphia coming up and I just wanted to do a big shout out to Macht Architecture and our local builders, um, Hansen fine building um, and we're excited about that. What we are also excited about starting uh, to work with Stolz Timber in Montana. 
because um, they, I wanted to jump in too earlier. Um, so right now they're they're still importing importing their uh, um, CLT, but they are planning on producing at some point as well. So and we we are actually working on prototyping for for developers right now, and it's 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 really exciting. Um, we are also excited along all these like kind of uh, project to develop our sim model because we do see a lot of potential in um, modeling that way um, and you know creating kind of user interfaces between us and the builder and um, the architects to kind of really streamline and get our our partner David to work on on software. Excellent. Um, Graham, I don't have you on my screen. Shoot, did Graham leave? Oh, you're there. Here. Yeah, Graham, what do, you, what do you see given the services that you guys are doing? Um, you know, how, how do you guys plan on growing and, and what are some of the things that you guys are involved in? Yeah, it's exciting times. I think, you know, and the part of the larger discussion is, you know, a lot of the industry is being pushed to prefabricated panels, but also volumetric modular. So there's, you know, we're only talking about prefabricated panels here today. But there's a, there's a big opportunity and the market's driving it that way. It's just, you know, cost and, and moving labor to where you can afford to, you know, build it, right? You can build a Vancouver building for Squamish prices, right? That's the, <laughs> that's the dream, right, David? And I think that, um, and you get to live in Squamish too. Well, you don't have to even go to Vancouver. So, but uh, what we're seeing though in the larger buildings is the lack of solutions is breaking a number of these projects financially. Um, to get to you know our 30 to 40 effective you know non-combustible walls or it, it's a real challenge it's a lot of insulation you know it's real details in, on the thermal bridging and you know most of these systems you know we're talking 100 bucks a square foot you know plus or minus 50 bucks at least or usually plus uh, on the cladding side so it's you know it's a big cost item you know it's competing with curtain wall but a way better performance so you know, that's why we've been pushing it and, and trying to get, uh, you know, players like, you know, Element 5 and Katera to do bigger and bigger buildings. Uh, and it's exciting, you know, Sidewalk Labs is you know, really pushing this as well. So there's going to be some big, big players here. And there's a huge opportunity. It's a big, big pie. And there's a lot of slices for everyone here. So it's exciting. Absolutely. Again, and then thanks for uh, being a sponsor for tonight. We appreciate that. And no so problem. again, you know, we talk about that pie and I, and I, I think what's nice about what everyone said and um, Aaron, we'll go to you too. Um, but even with all of these different points is everyone looks like uh, 2021 is gonna be a growing year, which is pretty exciting. Um, Aaron, what would you wanna comment to from, from Vapor Shield? And thanks again for being a sponsor tonight. Sorry, Aaron, I put you on the spot. Oh, no problem. I was just sitting down on my laurels there. Um, <laughs> Maybe my, my health is <clears throat> um, yeah so vapor shield had we've you know we've been uh, pursuing uh, mass timber and panelization and modular for many years now and so as the industry is growing that's something that we have matured with and we uh, have a great staff of a uh, technical team and field representatives that are constantly out doing training and mock-ups and helping to grow business for everyone and uh, we focus on durable, you know, building envelope systems. And we, we do it a little bit differently than, than some of the passive house approaches in that the, our airtight layer, we're pushing outboard a little bit more with the self-adhered membranes. Um, but with larger buildings, that tends to be the approach. And that's, that's what we've done. And we've done a lot of uh, both wood and metal uh, and a lot of modular as well. And so it's, um, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll continue down that road and, um, you know, we're actually getting more into, we're working on our life cycle assessments as well. And so uh, getting into our um, uh, carbon and optimizing our materials for that also. And uh, we've done a lot with the healthy materials side in the last few years as well. And so that's another area where we would like to see more and more disclosure in the industry and transparency also. Thanks, Aaron. Sorry, I was just trying to get uh, a question queued up. Um, I believe Roger Cooney is still with us. Roger, I was trying to give you the heads up. You had a question, you know, you put in about 40 minutes ago. You still, still up? I was just taking a nap over here. 
and actually it was, this was a pretty basic question but it gave me an opportunity to give a shout out to travis um if he's still hanging around are you there buddy yeah what's up roger good to see how, you. Are, you, how are your legs today after uh you know we were like hiking for our turns the last couple days and uh we must have <laughs> a zillion calories and so yeah. we, could drink, we could drink with you know impunity at this point so cheers 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 <laughs> It's getting yeah. a little late on the East Coast. I think yeah, it's a good time. Happy to see some snow up here. Yeah, it's coming, man. We got some today, and there's some in the forecast. And uh, so, if you don't want it in the desert, set it to the Northeast because we can <laughs> use them. Um, shout out, shout out to Oliver Klein too, Sean. You know, four seven five because he and I have been, you know, hanging out together a little bit here and there too. Last Excellent. time I saw him was with Scion in Southern Vermont. So good to see him and I love the work you guys are doing. And I gotta so say, much. I gotta say to sponsors who have got their stuff on the Declare website, who have gone out and done the, done the work to make something healthy for human beings and other living things on the planet. Big deal, big shout out for that kind of work. Love it. Um, Graham, you already answered my question and it wasn't baiting it, it's just, uh, Gave me an opportunity to say hello and uh, appreciate the work you're doing. Um, you know, there's there's a deeper dive on like all this stuff goes together and uh, you know these materials. Isn't it funny how everything's coming full circle back to wood? <laughs> or natural products? Yeah, natural products and uh, you know, uh, so I you know to me it's like those components that aren't wood fiber what's the lifespan and those kinds of things. And we don't have to get wonky at this hour, yeah. but it's like, the, you know, I, I prefer to call the angels as being in the detail, the details. And, uh, you know, I'm working for a general contractor that built two living buildings at the same time. Uh, and so that's, you know, fully certified. That's our kind of little feather in the cap. And it's like, how long does this stuff last? Is it a hundred years? Is it 200 years? So this isn't a throwdown, but you know, how do we get, how do we get the foam out? And how do we transition and uh and how do we take it to scale and we're we're yeah. doing a lot of smaller stuff you know so how to bring the dollars out how to bring the money down and uh you know where's the affordability for those folks who aren't very well healed and uh you know if we're going to go into a new year let's let's do it and and the whole equity piece um you know it's just it's really important stuff and and uh who's building those things yeah what's their living wage and you know it's uh it's not easy so that's my that's my little soapbox that's it I'm a little too heavy for this hour but there it is thanks all for good that. roger thanks for joining yeah, us again so, some good, good points roger. you brought up thanks, travis let's get the hill wax them up buddy because you know <laughs> we're going ripping there's powder there's powder day yeah. no problem to the powder day except <laughs> we're doing it, 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 it. <laughs> All right. Thank See you. Out there. All right, Roger. Thanks. Yeah, no, some good points, Roger. Again, we're trying to do a lot. And I mean, that's why, again, these, these summits help out is to educate and bring people together and collaborate and talk about the successes we're doing, the failures, so we can, we can grow and scale. So um, no, very, very good points. Um, I'm just going to check to see if Jason is still with us. I see about three or four more questions um, in the queue. Mary, there might be more that I've missed, but Jason, Jason, hey. when? Hey, Sean. There we go. How are you? Great. Doing great. You um, had a question. What? Yeah, uh, it's, I do have um, three questions, but we'll see how much time we have. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, specifically for Graham uh, at RDH, um, from, the, from the consultant side, and, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, um, how, how would I how did I assemble a rain rack to, large enough to test the window and charge it with enough pressure on site? That's, that's kind of a necessary thing to do in Vancouver, I'd say. Yep. Um, hello, you know, forest fires or forest fighting equipment, I should say, uh, those tanks they make, you can fill those up with water and get a big pump. So uh, <clears throat> testing, so, you know, let's go back to the questioning on, on testing, uh, you know, Factory testing, you can use obviously a you know water in the factory outside or whatever, but on site when you're doing performance mock-up or doing commissioning testing, you know it's there's not water when you need it there, especially with prefab with your well before anything else. 
Yeah. And and so you're you're bringing a tank, you're bringing water, what rather be a water truck, and then you're you're building a large rock and you're pressurizing with pumps and you're spraying a whole lot of water all over it. So, <laughs> but all right. you know, especially with the bigger buildings, I mean, that's uh, one thing I'd even encourage all the panel manufacturers is you know understand how it performs when it gets really wet. I think that's uh, you know we're we're there trying to help the industry you know avoid problems with with moisture. And, uh, you know, we don't want to see a bunch of prefab companies fail because they had, you know, bad joints or something like that. So try it out. Easy to do. Great. Um, that leads into my next question for most of the panelists. Um, what have been your most common failures and why? All right. Jason's bringing up the big question in the overtime uh -huh. here. Who wants to take that one on? Oh, I see they're jumping on this one, Jason. I'll prime it. I bet it's to do with their connections. <laughs> Graham's giving away the answers, folks. But I, I'd like to hear. I did like to hear. I have, I have a good one. I have a good one. Um, so we didn't have any real problems with connections, except for when we had a window that crossed over between two systems. That was tricky. And um, I'd love to hear how everybody, if the panelists are still here from, from the presentations, how they deal with that kind of detail. Um, and then also, if you're looking back to what Graham was talking about at different systems and pricing, um, how do you do that without getting pricing fatigue or design fatigue through the, through the project? Because that's real. No, that's a good good point, Shannon. Alan, you happen to be in the middle of my screen. You want to talk about some of the biggest failures in your career? No, just kidding. Is there? <laughs> what are some of the things that you've learned about, as Shannon was saying, is when you've got different connection points and and so forth. Well, I think are you are you talking more about big buildings, like? Well, in some applications too, when you've got different systems come together, I mean. I mean, for you guys, you're probably providing the entire shell. Um, you may not be providing, or you might be providing, you know, some of the, either the glue lamb or mass timber pieces. And um, those have been, could have been contracted out from somebody else or the steel package. And, you know, how do you deal with some of those kind of things where you've got different pieces come together that you may not be part of the scope of work, but the contractor thought you were the scope of work that took care of it. Yeah, I mean, we're, we tend to do, it all like we're general contractors so we we are responsible for the entire shell air tightness water tightness it's all under one house so we just have to do what we need to do to make that all work um you know we and our wall is set up so um you know we have a wrb over wood fiber and we flash the windows really really well and then we have a, a, a really thick rain screen so just never you know, knock on wood, other than some roof leaks, we really haven't known about any kind of wall leaks in our facade system. So, you know, make your panels watertight and airtight unto themselves and make sure you connect them well, which we've done a lot of different ways. And, you know, some have been more successful than others, but we're, we're using gaskets lately. And we think that's, that's a, we're getting a good result with that. It's a lot less messy than other systems. Jason, no, I'll be uh, fair to the panelists because just because they've been at this for, you know, over uh, two hours here. Um, you know, what's nice about the passive house world is the blow door, you know, that level of quality control to come in before the building is turned over to the clients um, where you can, again, you can check it for air leakages and typically, you know, if it's airtight, it's going to be watertight as well. In, in, in most applications, no gram might disagree with me a little bit on the technical side of that but for the most part the the blower door is a great part of the quality control before the homeowner takes it on and i think jason you had a third question um it's been two hours i'll i'll, I'll <laughs> leave it for, for other people perfect thanks jason for joining um and i think we had john bro from australia so again there's a few people that joined us from different continents and with all the different time changes thank you for that john you still with us 
Or did he actually go uh, go have lunch? Let me just check. Shoot. No. He has can, left with us. You can catch John Burrell on the Passive House podcast. I will share a link. <laughs> Excellent. Um, everyone, unless Mary, did I miss anything? But I, I think that was everybody. Mary's scanning through the the cutting and pasting she's done to keep us all together here. Well, unless I'm not seeing anybody that you're missing, but yeah. Again, thank you for being the uh, question concierge tonight, Mary. I know it's not an easy task, especially when there's a lot of people tonight. And again, I mean, uh, people are still interested. We still got 90 people that are uh, that have been hanging out with us. It's great. So, if anyone does need to leave, please do so. I'll probably stick around for about another eight more minutes um unless there's anything else but i know my dinner is getting cold um but i didn't want to leave until we took care of everybody so thank you for joining us from all across north america and again too i think there's one person from russia so it's always uh it's always neat to see where people join us from so thank you very much and i mean i, I did see there's this discussions of where do we get prefab products in australia as well as in in the uk so um great that this whole discussion spark an interest uh, across the globe. Again, thanks to Aaron and Graham from uh, sponsoring tonight's show. And uh, for some of you, we will see you tomorrow night. If not, we'll see you Wednesday night. And, uh, and I'm sure if not, you'll catch one of the various uh, opportunities with the Paso Accelerator with either the podcast or with, uh, with Mary's publications. In the chat it's funny actually mary i uh um i thought jay might be here and bug me about pass or about prefab books and so i had to pull out some of your books so i've got a few few of yours in my collection here so, some good old ones you know net zero california pass those buildings so can't give those ones away oh and uh in this one, Passive House in Different Climates, we had the um, Eco Cocoon in the, where was that? Anyway, there's an Eco Cocoon project here in Europe. Excellent. Got to get my hands on that one. How about uh, Julia Torres Moskowitz's? That's a good one. Thanks, everybody. And, um, I'm going to throw up a couple links here on the chat for further questions. To the, um, there's our professional downloads from Eco Cocoon as well as uh, frequently asked questions. Yes, thanks Travis, because I had organized all of your websites nice at the end of my notes and I totally forgot. So for those that are still here, let me just drop that in the chat as well. So at least it's kind of all grouped. Um, the chat was really good tonight. So you might want to save the chat so that all these lovely links you can uh, keep after we wrap things up. And if, uh, if you need, you know, if you missed any of the stuff, reach out to me. Um, I'll just throw in mine, my f info here. And let's uh, keep connecting. Yeah. yeah, we'll have a video recording of this, uh, of this summit uh, available by next week. So keep your eyes open for that. Thanks, we should We should be able to include chat, the chat stream there too. Great. All right, everyone. Again, I'll stick around for five minutes if there's any last minute questions, but I think we should give uh, the presenters a big round of applause for sticking this out and providing all the fabulous information. And uh, can't wait to see what 2021 brings to you with all these fabulous plans. And, uh, you know, again, I can't wait to actually come to one of your facilities, but the fact that we could do it virtually was pretty cool how we got to travel across North America from the East Coast, from Kansas City to Santa Fe to to either uh, Victoria or Invermeer um, and then up to Squamish. And so good, glad that we're able to travel pretty, pretty easily. So thank you guys for joining us. All righty. Thank you. I think that's it, everyone. Go. Okay. Oh, good night, night everybody. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Have thanks a good for, night. Be thanks well. for sticking around so long. Appreciate Bye. it, everyone. Take care. Mm -hmm.